Oh, so what I did actually was go back to look at what I'd done before, and I'm, I'm resurrecting a program that uh, I think some people like Margot probably saw most of this um, years ago, uh, because these were really important pictures to me and encapsulated both habitat and native plants quite a bit. Um, and I've always thought that when you build it, they come anyway, whether your intention was to build a habitat or not. Um, any little smidgen of garden is going to have um, life forms um, surrounding it. And we're, we're very lucky. Some of us have, you know, a balcony and some of us have more space. So these photographs, for the most part, are from uh, my front yard and backyard especially. And a couple are from uh, plants of the Southwest uh, during the time I was there because I always really tried to have a camera with me. Um, so uh, I guess we'll get started. Um, you know, none of us ever get to the stage of wisdom that we want and um, we learn constantly. I'm a student for my entire life. I, I, I've learned a lot. Uh, I know a few things, but nature teaches me every day and nature is in charge and I respect that and I work with nature. And um, uh, like Sarah said, my background is, is long and varied and I was really lucky um, to have started so long ago. I started uh, collecting plants when I was a kid. I grew up here, I was in the foothills, I was in the mountains, in the mesas. And I knew the plants by their look. I could tell you when they bloomed. I could tell you what insects or birds or reptiles you might find around. Uh, these communities on the mesas and in the foothills. Uh, I grew up here in the 60s, so it was a completely different place. I didn't know the names of all the plants, but I certainly started to learn the names of the animals. It wasn't until um, landscape started to shift in the 80s and 90s, and the word xeriscape started to be bandied about, and native plants were actually being grown by a couple of people. And I, I was at a tree conference, and I stumbled uh, into a presentation by a, a, a woman who's now a, a longtime friend, Judith Phillips, who was growing these plants and put names to the plants that I knew very well and had a book coming out about them. Then uh, a couple of years later, uh, there was a Xeriscape conference, I think the second one in New Mexico, but the first in Albuquerque. And there I met uh, Gail Haggard, who also was uh, um, you know, one of my earlier mentors, so many of you that I see here in this meeting, I've learned a lot from over the years, and I'm so grateful, but, um, you know, the wisdom of the sages, the wisdom of the owls, I don't, I don't know that I'll ever have that. Uh, these are baby screech owls that I was blessed with uh, uh, greeting when I was at Plants of the Southwest. There was a hollow in a tree up the street, and one day six baby screech owls showed up at the nursery, hung out for a few days, and, uh, and then disappear just as quickly. But uh, it uh, gave me an opportunity to learn a little bit about screech owls and you know how great they are with insects. And had I known about them in the moth invasions of the 70s, I, I think they probably helped us to some degree here. Um, you know, when we think about habitats, all of us are a little bit different, how protected our backyards are, how uh, open they are, how escapable or secure they are. And um, I'm pretty lucky uh, that I've got a, a pretty secure backyard. And for any of you that have been to a tour at this garden, you'll see or you'll maybe remember that my front yard faces west and is super hot and really xeric and lots of, you know, Apache plume and chamisa and three-leaf sumac and agaves and what used to be a well-manicured uh, blue grandma buffalo grass lawn when I first moved in the neighborhood. It's now a wild meadow full of little blue stem and, and you know, just all sorts of things. The backyard is almost the opposite. It's more of a mountain habitat. Um, neighbors to the south of me built a giant two-story house that put half my garden into shade from uh, September to March, the sun is just coming back. So uh, it cooled the temperature by 20 degrees. It uh, held more moisture. So I was able to um, grow things that you'll see throughout the pictures here. So when you look at the, some of the pictures that are coming up, it's gonna look pretty lush, but a lot of it is actually native. 
Um, I'd like to, to introduce you to an old friend of mine. This is um, Mr. T. He's a, a turtle that, a box turtle that came to me, oh gosh, 20, almost 25 years ago. Uh, I had a female box turtle already in the backyard. You'll meet her later. Her name's Big Mama. But Mr. T was found by some uh, neighbors walking their daughters in strollers. These are young women in their 30s now, but uh, they brought Mr. T into my garden. And I learned from observing every single day. Um, Roadrunners, you know, we have, when I was a kid here growing up, you almost never saw roadrunners, but with all the backyard habitat activity going on now, um, roadrunners um, are proliferating. And part of it, I think, is because we're making habitats, we're putting out backyard bird feeders, and where we once displaced them by disrupting their habitats, now we're offering a new food source with sparrows and, and finches and, and who knows what. Um, this is a roadrunner at Plants of the Southwest, but I have roadrunners now that have been nesting in my neighborhood uh, for years. I have a neighbor two houses up that has mostly um, choya, agave, various yuccas, uh, um, very, very xeric and wild landscape. The, the roadrunners nest there and come down here. Over the years, they've watched me feeding my box turtles mealworms and the roadrunner a couple years ago started eating mealworms last year when covid hit um and i started to feel isolated uh, i was working out in my yard doing my spring cleaning one day and uh, a female roadrunner showed up and just hung around so i talked to her for a bit you know i didn't care if the neighbors saw me i was out in the front yard but uh um, i thanked her for coming to lighten my day while I was wondering what this uh, pandemic was going to do to us. And over the course of the entire season and three batches of young, uh, she got to the point where, and maybe I shouldn't have done this, but she eats out of my hand. She sits next to me. Uh, when her kids get big enough, she brings them over. They don't all, they haven't become tame. It's only the mom that, that comes, but it's a really nice way to interact with the wildlife, um, observe their seasons of nesting, understand how many young they lose. Um, so just watching all of the animals and the insects and uh, just all of the life over the years, we've been in this house 30 years, it's just been super educational. This and Lee, I have to apologize, the other night when we tested this and, and went through a couple of slides, it's not a broad tail, it's a female black chinned. I'm sorry I said it was broad tail, but this is a female black chinned uh, hummingbird on fern bush that um, I was at Plants of the Southwest. I had a new camera with a really great zoom lens and I was kind of walking around to see what I could see. And fern bush, for any of us that have observed it with those great white flowers, it's a super pollinator plant. There's always something going on on fern bush. So I went back to see what bees, wasps, who I might see. And what did I see but a hummingbird and a dragonfly playing chase around this fern bush. And I tried and tried to get um, photographs of, of both of them. Uh, and I, I have pictures of the hummingbird's feet at the top of the frame and a tip of dragonfly's wing. Finally, the hummingbird paused for just a moment on the fern bush. And I was able to capture this later in the presentation. Um, you'll see the dragonfly uh, that was, uh, was playing tag. but. Um, you know, I think for all of us that love plants, love the outdoors, uh, love nature, love all the interconnected relationships, these are the kind of important um, escapes that we find from the challenges of pandemics and politics and stress of day to day. And I have just always gotten so much joy from this. So um, I want to talk a little when it comes to creating a habitat, there are some things that are really important uh, to, to have um, in your garden. So of course, food is the main thing. If you want to bring in wildlife to observe, um, they have to have food sources. So the best thing to do is to have a huge diversity of plants and specifically native plants um, to bring in the native wildlife to um, give them uh, the food that they need, whether it's seeds or nectar or pollen or, or leaf litter or whatever, but you can introduce things. Um, loose seed, 
I don't use much um, because it can tend to bring in lots of doves and maybe pigeons, depending on where you are. This particular picture, uh, back in 1987, uh, an umbrella cockatoo flew up and landed on my window at a house we used to live in. And I put out my arm and she flew over. I had her for almost 30 years and would still have her, but after outliving two dogs, three cats, a child growing up and moving out, uh, when it was just my wife and I, the bird um, uh, needed so much more attention. We bought two more cats to give the bird attention, but I eventually I took five years to find somebody to uh, uh, that I could adopt the bird to, but this is food that the bird used to throw on the ground. So when I said I don't use loose bird feeders, when I had the cockatoo, she was messy, and so I would put this bowl out on a tree stump in the backyard and just watch, and it would bring in you know, jays and doves and all sorts of things, including mice. Um, so the mouse later, you'll see uh, uh, how smart this mouse was to decide where to live. I have plenty of plants with nectar. I have fruit producing plants, um, lots of berry producing plants. Um, and all of this draws in various insects. So it's just a, a crazy busy source of um, life. It's just amazing. Um, you know, I use seed cylinders because they're cleaner uh, and they don't uh, scatter as much seed. So the cylinders bring in, you know, lots of woodpeckers. Here's a young male ladderback woodpecker. So I have ladderbacks and uh, they're really common and they're on multiple generations of breeding around this yard. Certainly I see the occasional downy woodpecker had, uh, had one in here last week and right now, uh, the largest of the woodpeckers that we get here, the northern flickers, are in town. Uh, they don't stay year-round, um, so I enjoy the flickers, uh, the couple of seasons where they sort of move through. But um, when you use a wide variety of, uh, of seed and natural plant sources, you really diversify the wildlife that you bring in. And not only are they feeding on the food sources, but they're eating insects and fertilizing the, the ground and offering all sorts of um, all, all sorts of things. And, you know, of course I have, uh, I have five hummingbird feeders of various kinds scattered around the yard. Um, you know, uh, the families sort of pick the ones they feed out of mostly and then the roof shows up and it becomes a real competition. But uh, hummingbird feeders are great and the mix, uh, the ratio of sugar and water for hummingbird feeders is, is the same mix you would use in oriole feeders. So uh, the oriole feeder, I think I have on here a little bit later, it's different, but um, having some, some good sources around are really nice. Um, here's a group of uh, female lesser goldfinches on a niger thistle uh, feeder. Um, uh, a long time ago, it seemed like the goldfinches were also seasonal, but the last number of years, they seem to be year round. So I try to keep this uh, stocked and keep it clean. Um, it's really important to try to keep your feeders clean, especially the, the nectar feeders, but um, this is just great to, to watch the goldfinches and, and, and how they change their plumage from, especially the males, from uh, breeding season to the off season. It, it's really just a joy to watch them. One of my favorite birds, and these guys are like something out of a Disney film. These are bush tits, and they're so tiny. When you look at them, their eyes are like little glass beads, and their legs are like the finest wire. You wonder how they even support the body, and they make me think about... Um, you know, like when I was a kid and maybe watched Walt Disney's Cinderella and the bluebirds dress Cinderella and were so cheerful. These, these guys fly in groups. Uh, they tend to flock in about groups of 15 to 20, and they even group nest. I, I haven't seen a nest in my yard, but when I was at Plants of the Southwest, uh, we had a particular juniper that these bush tits would um, nest in. And they build this nest out of fern bush and Apache plume. And it's interesting, and I'm not sure this is my observation, my opinion, I haven't looked for any studies that verify this, but when they first build the nest, it looks like a long droopy sock or the toe of pantyhose with a, a hole up in the top. 
and the outside initially they put juniper on it and it's really sticky and i've asked myself if that stickiness is to two things hold it together but also maybe to deter predators or other insects like ants but the inside of the nest of the bush tits is lined with the softest, the feathers of Apache plume. It's just incredible. And the eggs are, are you know, about the size of a pea. And 15 birds may share the nest and the females may lay the eggs and this whole flock takes turns um, uh, keeping the eggs warm. And it's just the most interesting thing. And then they flit around from tree to tree to tree, you know, signaling where the good food is. You know, a number of years ago, I was speaking at, um, it was after the Xeriscape conference got real big and it was, you know, the Land and Water Summit and it had become kind of this international thing. And, you know, I was still invited to speak there when there were landscape architects doing brilliant work and designers and authors and these people who I admire just doing incredible things. And, and I got up once after having to follow, I don't remember if it was, a speaker that had designed uh, a, a huge artwork up in uh, Colorado that shed water onto an enormous cistern under a parking lot that fed out into native landscapes. Or maybe it was the speaker that did a highway in Israel where they ran storm water to reestablish olive groves. But these people doing incredible things. And I got up there feeling, you know, a little small and sort of said, you know, I, I, I haven't done that, but I could tell you when I walk into my backyard in the spring and the first soft green leaves are coming out of the forestiera and they're just beginning to flower and I see a silken thread with a little green inchworm from the cabbage looper swinging down and then a bush tit flies in and snags it and then another and another and next thing I know this um, infested tree is covered with these joyous little birds um, feeding on the caterpillars, feeding on the aphids. Um, you know, I, I was a, a pesticide applicator in my early days in those commercial landscape days with lawns and pesticides. I sprayed my share of Roundup and Trimac and Isotox and Chlordane and Lindane back in the 70s. And I thought, oh, woo woo, these organic people. But I took a, a, a workshop with New Mexico State University doing a, an integrated pest management program. I was at Loveless at the time. Uh, we had clinics all over town and we had started planting native plants. Judith did the first uh, Zurich landscape for us. And um, I started monitoring the landscapes and watching the birds and watching the bugs. And my God, I haven't sprayed, uh, uh, I haven't used a chemical in, 30 years. I, I don't buy fertilizers. I don't do anything. I just watch and I learn. You know, here's an Oriole feeder. It's got some grape jelly. It has uh, some orange halves. Not an Oriole. This is a finch that's uh, there now, but uh, uh, I have uh, a couple of these around the yard. When I see the Oriole show up, I put those out. Um, but the plants are really the key. So this is a uh, Forestera, New Mexico olive, um, or privet, neither an olive nor a privet, but named so for the shape of the seeds here, the berries. And um, I've tasted them because the birds go mad for them. And I don't know if any of you have, but they're the most bitter, astringent, uh, awful tasting berries, but boy, do the birds love them and they're prolific. So this is a great food source and habitat source for any number of, of berry eating bird species, uh, as well as bringing in some insects for other birds to feed on. Uh, a fabulous plant, we all know it, it's um, uh, riparian in nature initially. Uh, you can find it in the bosque, sort of in the cottonwood groves down along the river, but it's one of those super tough natives that I think evolved sort of in flood plains, so it can take a lot of saturation, but it's also one of the most xeric plants. It's naturally an understory plant, so it can tolerate uh, a bit of shade, but it also tolerates full sun. I have probably seven or 10 of these in my garden, some which grow in the shade half the year from that two-story house, 
one out in the front yard that it's luck if it gets sort of barely watered once a month and um, just a, a beautiful tough habitat plant. Um, this one is, is not native uh, particularly, but if this is a hawthorn, this is uh, a Douglas hawthorn, but I have a number of hawthorns. Um, I have Kansas hawthorn, Douglas hawthorn, Washington hawthorn, um, Downey hawthorn, and they flower and they fruit at various times. Most of them are spring fruiters, but the Washington is an autumn fruiter. So when you have the hawthorns, not only are they fairly xeric, pretty adaptable to sun and shade, uh, beautiful white flowers, it kind of don't smell great, but attract a lot of pollinators. But the berries are, are just a treasure uh, for the berry eating birds. And then the thorny structure of the plant is great habitat and hiding when the roadrunners come hunting, all, all the little birds can uh, zoom up into the hawthorn branches and, um, and through the sumac and, and hide from the roadrunners. Uh, this is one of the most delicious berries. This is golden currant. Um, uh, most of us know that it's named golden for the color of the flowers, not the berry. Uh, the flowers are a brilliant golden yellow and quite spicy and sort of shift colors uh, after they're pollinated. But the berries um, are absolutely delicious and um, the birds uh, just go nuts for these. This is a plant that is probably more of a moderate water user and better in higher elevations. In the hotter and drier areas of Albuquerque, it tends to uh, really get a little bit off color and defoliate to a degree in the hottest part of the summer. Um, but uh, it, it's tough. It, it uh, uh, comes back very, very nicely. Uh, and because of the habits of the birds um, eating the berries and flying up to wires in the tops of other trees, in my yard, this among the other berry producing plants, I get tons of volunteers. And depending on where the plant is, quite often a volunteer picks a better place to grow than you chose um, deciding where you were going to plant it. So um, I have these sort of, not where I originally planted them 30 years ago, but they've shown up around the yard and if they're happy and, and can fulfill their, their growth habits in the space they've uh, volunteered, I leave them. Um, I sort of designed this landscape around dog paths. It was a bare landscape when we bought the house. And I certainly spent a lot of years uh, adding plants and I, I still do because I'm a mad gardener, but um, I've also really become grateful for the volunteers um, that are plants that I love that have a function and a use that are multi-use um, and, and I let them go where they will. One year uh, when we had a huge bumper crop of these things, we did a little Martha Stewart moment. I've talked to some of you maybe about this and we went out, we collected a huge stainless steel bowl of berries and we decided we're gonna make pancake syrup. Um, that's a lot of work and like melting snow for waters, it takes a lot of berries to produce a little syrup. It was one of the most delicious syrups I've ever had, but we haven't done it again. <laughs> um, cacti are, are fabulous habitat plants um, and super xeric and come in so many forms uh, and the flowers uh, of cacti are, are, are like from out outer space are some of the most beautiful flowers and very well timed for lots of native pollinators. There are native ground dwelling bees whose entire life cycle um, is based around the blooming cycles of specific species of cacti. And then they also produce these delicious and beautiful fruits, which are um, uh, treasured by all sorts of wildlife. The fruits are edible, the pads are edible, um, they're just amazing. Um, over the years, it's kind of funny because I just watch things. I've, I, I could tell you what um, lizard poop looks like, certain bird poop, I can tell you what. Uh, toads are very interesting. Uh, what they eat, coyotes eat a ton of cactus fruit. And when you're out and you find coyote scat, one of the primary food sources for coyotes uh, are, are the, the fruits of, uh, uh, of the cactus. So just uh, an amazing plant. 
Um, this is in my front yard uh, a few years ago. Um, uh, it's not, some of these things aren't there. This is uh, an Agastaki group uh, in the front. Uh, I love the Agastakis. They're terrific pollinator plants. The flowers are edible. They make great tea. The leaves are edible. Hummingbirds love them. They're terrifically fragrant. Um, most of them are probably in the moderate water use range and some last for years and years in my experience and some are shorter lived perennials. Behind it you'll see the blooming chamisa. Um, there are people I know, some horticulturists who swear that it never should have been changed from Chrysothamnus to Erica Maria. Um, Margo will remember uh, a thousand years ago when I sort of poo-pooed some botanical Latin because working with the general public, they want the common names, but I actually love a lot of the Latin names and Chrysothamnus nauseosus uh, was one that I loved and, and the nauseosus, I know so many people think uh, they smell like dirty socks, but um, the chamisa brings in a huge range of pollinators, plus being super xeric, really tough, uh, resilient. Um, it, it's one of my favorite native plants. Uh, through the background, you can sort of see uh, some agaves back there, and there's some uh, Artemisia tridentata, some other Artemisias, and certainly the, the blue grama that is in the foreground that's just coming to seed there. When I moved in this neighborhood, it's kind of the Knob Hill uh, neighborhood on the uh, north end of the Ridgecrest area, and when we bought the house, Xeriscape uh, wasn't as huge as it is, or native plants weren't as uh, broadly um, accepted or utilized. Um, so when I moved in, I had this little native grass, buffalo blue grandma lawn that I mowed. I kept it nice and neat, put crusher fine around the edge, planted chamisa and Apache plume and Artemisia tridentata, uh, thinking that the way I spaced them where they put them for all the neighbors knew they might've well been rose bushes. Uh, I kept up that appearance for about two years, then my lawnmower broke. And um, I really didn't want to mow the lawn anymore, so I let the blue grandma go. And um, this is when I was still back in the landscape business, and people would walk by and just love that blue grandma waving in the wind and want to come roll in it. And I ended up probably designing... 13 landscapes within dog walking distance of my house based on people coming to see the native plants. So um, sometimes uh, letting things go wild is uh, a great way to introduce people to the possibilities beyond conformity or um, chemical use or um, water hogging um, non-natives. But then you have some that uh, have a niche that aren't natives. This is um, the Blanche Sandman honeysuckle. It's um, a nice honeysuckle. It tends to be a little deciduous, but it's um, smaller than like Hall's honeysuckle. So if you have a smaller patio or a courtyard, uh, the flowers of this are, are quite lovely and certainly a great hummingbird attractor. Um, so a small trellis, a nice little wall for smaller spaces. This is uh, a wonderful honeysuckle uh, for a smaller space. You know, one of the plants that I think probably a lot of us adore is chocolate flower. These guys are tough and tenacious and um, will go where they want to go. They like the hottest, driest, most gravelly soil, kind of like uh, Bellia multiradiata, the desert marigold. They have sort of a similar niche. These guys I had planted and the seeds blew around and the place they picked to naturalize was where the crusher fine met a concrete sidewalk. It gave them just enough. This is in the front yard. It's not on drip. I hand water every couple of weeks, maybe not even that much anymore. And so the whole walk up to my front door in the morning is just this chocolate extravaganza. In um, our yard, I let these go, uh, totally go to seed. The goldfinches love the seed of chocolate flower, as do some other birds, but especially goldfinches. Then when the plant is sort of splayed out and flopping over midsummer, I just cut it to the ground and then it pops back up and is just as beautiful again towards uh, late summer into the fall. 
you know, certainly there's a place in everybody's garden for sunflowers. They're, they're joyous, they're brilliant, they're huge. They attract uh, a wide variety of pollinators. Here's a, a bumblebee. Um, bumblebees are, are now as threatened, if not more so than uh, the European honeybee that gets all the press uh, due to climate change and various uh, habitat destructions. The plants are moving farther and faster than the insects can follow them. Um, so there's all sorts of reasons to watch and learn who lives in and around your yard and try to plant things uh, that help them out. I think there's maybe a little cucumber beetle up on one of those petals too. But um, native bees, the longhorn bees, love, love sunflowers. Um, so if you have a space, you can even grow sunflowers in pots. They're just, um, the, they say happy summer like almost another, uh, no other plant does. You need to have water sources in your yard. Um, and I apologize if some of the text isn't great, but I'll, I'll talk about it so people can see it. Uh, I think uh, uh, moving water is, is the best for drawing in wildlife. Uh, you need to keep them clean and refresh them regularly, especially small standing basins. This one bubbling stone, I just got a stone and borrowed a neighbor's hammer drill with a three quarter bit, uh, drilled through it, made a little recirculating thing out in the center of the backyard. That one stone has been responsible for bringing in more wildlife than probably any other feature in our garden. I also have uh, uh, traditional bird baths. I have basins at the, the ground level. So having uh, multiple sources is, is much better. You know, they make little solar water wigglers to make the surface move because birds flying over see that reflection. So moving water, um, is really uh, a great draw for a lot of different birds. You know, this is a, a cement uh, bird bath that I picked up at Walmart at the end of the summer on clearance. I think it cost me like 15 bucks. Sadly, the top no longer exists because I have raccoons in the yard and they come and uh, tip things over and eventually they broke that. So I, 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 I don't know how many bird baths I've replaced. Uh, this is a pretty thick understory of dwarf plumbago. You can see some uh, Virginia creeper in there. Uh, there are iris. I have a lot of bulbs in this bed, so when everything is dormant in the winter, uh, it, it, it's kind of, um, except for the mahonia that you see uh, a little bit to the right, I'm sorry, to the left and a little bit to the right, uh, um, it's kind of open so the bulbs can grow up in the spring and flower and do their thing. And then as the plumbago comes, the bulbs die back. That uh, mahonia that you see over there is a volunteer from a mahonia I had in the front yard. A bird sat up in the catalpa tree, which this bird bath is under. Uh, the mahonia grew up and I've learned that it's one of the first uh, nectar sources and pollen sources for the mason bee. Um, one of the whole dwelling native bees that we have, the almost metallic little blue bees. So um, I have that around. This is actually not my backyard, but one right down the street that I designed for um, some neighbors. This is a pond in their backyard. So maybe you want a pond with a little bit of a waterfall. Um, I like to talk about what a brilliant landscape designer I am, kind of like I could have designed Stonehenge. Um, this path in my backyard, you see sort of that... Uh, uh, lattice wood, the aspen doorway, that faces east and the rising sun shines through it and illuminates uh, the waters it bubbles. Then from the point of view that this photograph is taken, there's yet another doorway between Three Leaf Sumac and Lilac Hedges where the setting sun also comes in and illuminates that. I actually had no idea. I put the fountain there because that's where I thought it would set and, and I couldn't have been happier that by happenstance um, the rising and setting sun illuminate it and also helped to draw in the wildlife. So I'm not that brilliant of a designer, but I like to pretend. <laughs> but putting it there in the middle, it's kind of an open space. And so some of my wildlife has found it and found ways to utilize that. So this is um, Big Mama. This is uh, the female turtle. She's the oldest. So I had box turtles when I was a kid here. Um, uh, the uh, Western or ornate box turtle, one showed up in my parents' backyard. This is back when Albuquerque mostly didn't have walls around the yards in the far Northeast heights up by the foothills. 
So I always had a fondness for box turtles. So when we bought this house and I got enough of a landscape, I actually went to a pet shop and bought this turtle. She's been in this yard for almost the entire 30 years. Um, she uh, learned certainly how to get a drink out of this uh, bubbling stone, as did this toad. Um, we had a neighbor across the street with a swimming pool. And one day while my son, who at the time was a little boy out skateboarding, the neighbor came out shrieking that there was something in her swimming pool and she was scared to death, this big fat toad. So uh, our son brought it to our yard and it lived with us for a number of years. It, it's not there anymore, but you can see how the toad also learned how to uh, gather moisture and cool down um, with this water feature. This is a water basin that I probably never would have bought myself. I mean, some of you might find it sort of cute. I find it sort of kitschy and actually kind of ugly, um, but it was a gift somebody gave to me. So I stuck it out in the backyard on the ground uh, as I usually do in the summer. One day I came home from work. I went out to walk around in water. And when I did, this toad was actually hanging over the edge with his front legs up over the front. So I ran in to get my camera. Of course, by the time I came back out, he was already in there, but this shows how useful a very uh, varying um, sizes, shapes, uh, and heights uh, of water features can be to different wildlife in your garden. When I was talking about scat a little earlier, what I learned when I saw toad poop on the patio and smashed it open when it was dry to see what was in there, toads come out at night as do cockroaches. So if you have cockroaches on your patio at night, if you have some moist soil and a place, a habitat that can, can support toads, great cockroach control. <laughs> Everything needs cover. Everything needs a place to hide. Uh, so you should have mixes of, of low cover, very high cover, should be a mix of uh, evergreen and deciduous. Uh, the more diversity, the better. The more diversity in all of your landscape. I say perennials here, but annuals have their place. Shrubs, trees, um, the more the merrier. Uh, because the, the more um, diversity of plant material, the more diverse cover that you have, the more diverse wildlife you're going to attract. These uh, uh, echinacea, these purple cone flowers, just sort of naturalize their way through a little bed. And so again, this, you know, I maybe had planted a couple of them years ago. And now at, at cone flower time, I've got this pink river that runs along the walkway uh, in the backyard. Uh, this is the walkway to the lower left where you can see the cone flowers naturalizing. Um, there is gay feather, liatris there that's naturalized, some native and adaptive grasses, uh, northern sea oats, a uh, little blue stem, thread grass, wheat grass. Um, that's back when I used to have a pool. I don't have a pool in the yard anymore. So that's one of my former sculptures peering up. It used to be a giant orchid, but uh, I put her out in the backyard for fun and uh, unexpected hailstorm destroyed her. So she spent some time being a bean trellis when I took out pool decking and had a vegetable garden back there. But you can see kind of the highs, the lows, the density. This sort of gives you an idea of um, open patterns and dense patterns and the way that wildlife can uh, filter its way throughout the garden. Sometimes I get special little treats, like I'm sitting up at the upper patio in the corner of the backyard where the grapevines are, and I hear, hear some rustling, and the thrasher is peering at me through the grapevines. Um, some of these birds have been nesting generation after generation in this garden for so long, I talk to them. Some flee, and you know, some are more shy, but some aren't, like the thrashers and the roadrunners. They're, they're like old friends. Um, you know, this is an example for a number of years, garlic chives moved vigorously throughout the yard. Now they've sort of naturalized in smaller groups in other places, but garlic chives, not only are they uh, edible, they have these wonderful flowers, these beautiful seed heads, but they're great pollinator attractors and they're tough. And um, I used to try to dig them out and then my feet would stink and my hands would stink. And finally, I just let them go and eventually they moved where they were happy. But this is an example uh, to the right side of the photograph would be where the neighbors built the two-story house. This used to be a vegetable and herb garden, but when it went to shade, I could no longer grow vegetables there. It killed my rosemary. It killed most of my English thyme. Didn't kill the lavender, but it allowed wood violets and columbines and salad burnet. 
and um, wild geraniums and all of these things just to sort of naturalize. And so um, I don't fight landscapes. I just kind of go with the flow. Um, this is an example of how that stone is in a clearing in the yard. So where some of the other pictures were a little denser, this gives you an example of how um, uh, you need some open spaces. Some birds uh, and other wildlife feel safer where they're open, where they can see a predator coming around. You can kind of see on the closer portion, it's a time lawn. I used to have buffalo grass when we had dogs. And once the dogs aged out, I was kind of wandered a time lawn. So that's the portion that gets sun, uh, but um, uh, more sun the, uh, than the, the shader part to the right is where the house really shades. But in the background behind the stone, you see the columbines and wood violets um, that have sort of naturalized in there. Um, here's Mr. Toad under the golden currants, uh, digging down around some iris in a flower bed. Um, I'm sad that he's moved on. I don't think I keep my yard damp enough for him. He was here for maybe five years. Uh, these are some um, baby doves hanging out in the yard. Uh, this is just another dense uh, 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 sort of a, a meadowy uh, side, some Mount Mahogany, some Aspen and unpruned um, uh, Mugo pine, uh, native and ornamental grasses. Everybody needs a place to raise their young, need places for nesting, laying eggs, uh, burrowing, feeding, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, I welcome everybody here, birds, insects, reptiles, amphibians, um, not all mammals. I wish the raccoons and I wish the rock squirrels would move away, but otherwise it's just very, very interesting um, to, to watch what happens out there. This is the larva of black swallowtail butterfly. I discovered uh, these on rue. This is on rue. They love fennel. They love parsley. When my son was little, we saw these caterpillars. We put them in a little uh, plastic insect thing with a magnifier lid and, and kept it outside in the shade and fed it the plants we saw it eating. And it formed a chrysalis. And we stuck the chrysalis in uh, 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 the stick that it was on in so a hole in the stucco on the back wall and came home one day to see the black swallowtail emerging. This is not that one, but this is a swallowtail that emerged. And right now it's clinging and drying its leaves on the garlic chives. Um, one of the things I, in my habitat, I used to, um, like when I first introduced the male turtle to the female turtle, I thought it was a good idea. This is another male turtle that a friend gave me um, after Mr. T was in the yard. But when you put the genders together, um, this happens. And I didn't know how successful turtles could breed in the backyard. They breed like rabbits only in secret. And you sometimes only find the dead ones that didn't make it or the ones that the raccoons tore apart, or you don't see them till they're adults. And so now I tell people have a couple of females or a lone male, but please do not mix them because I've created a monster. I started to rescue them from the raccoons. I built a little habitat box to put them in. Then I ran into, some of you probably know Ted Hodaba, ran into him at a pet shop once when I was buying mealworms to feed the, the multitude of babies. And he said, Wes, your yard is a habitat feed the raccoons. You're the one that started that. So, you know, let's be careful of what we build because they will come. And, um, you know, sometimes uh, it was uh, uh, my love of wildlife led me down a path that I probably shouldn't have gone on. This is uh, a robin uh, during nesting season at Plants of the Southwest. We also had roadrunners simultaneously nesting there. So I'll share a macabre and kind of sad little story about those encounters. Um, this is in my backyard, a fledgling robin learning how to find the berries in the New Mexico olive. But back at the nursery, when the baby roadrunners, like little velociraptors, were first getting out and about, the mom took them over to the pecan shell pile. And I got this nice shot of the mother roadrunner trying to feed her baby pecan shells. But at the same time, the fledgling robins were coming out and I know roadrunners. So one of my employees asked, oh, the baby robins, what should we name them? And 
I kind of said, well, that one's appetizer, that one's lunch, and that one's dinner, because what happened was the Roadrunners caught a robin, fed their babies robin, and they never wanted to eat pecans again. So it's another thing that we learn about the food chain. Uh, this is one of my favorite. Uh, uh, this is a Western Kingbird, one of the flycatchers on the top of a juniper in my backyard. These are the just out of the nest baby Western Kingbirds at Plants of the Southwest in that grove of native netleaf hackberries. And um, the birds eventually learn to fly and catch their um, food on the wing, but I watched again and again, season after season, when these guys came out of the nest, the adult fly catchers would line up the little babies on the telephone wires and then fly down and snatch an Etley Packberry uh, berry and feed it to the baby. And pretty soon the babies were feeding on these berries. So it was just a joy to watch how they teach them to fly on the wing and snatch a, a, a a berry that's motionless, so eventually they can start snatching flying insects. Um, just incredible. You know, sustainable gardening practices are super important. No um, inputs of herbicides, pesticides. If you use fertilizer at all, go organic. Um, just watch your landscape and learn. I don't even buy organic fertilizers for my yard. I get plenty from the birds and the turtles and the toads and the lizards, the raccoons. And um, I think it's just a happier environment when you just watch and sort of let it be. Um, it's just amazing the life forms that you can have in there. Uh, this is fennel in my garden, and this is the bush tits on the fennel. If you look closely right about center screen and then sort of lower left and lower right, you can see these little white dots, some in clusters and some individual. Those are lacewing eggs. So the, the lacewing insect feeds on this. So I like to tell people that fennel is one of the best habitat plants you can have. Not only is it edible for humans, but adult ladybugs, juvenile ladybugs, adult lacewings, juvenile lacewings, um, aphids uh, of all instars, bush tits. Um, there's probably like 11 life forms at least that feed off of fennel, a great pollinator plant, um, just terrific for the garden. Um, mullen is a great pollinator plant. It's a medicinal plant. It has multiple uses and uh, bees just love mullens. Um, tough, tough plant. And during the toilet paper shortage, uh, mullen leaves are also known as Texas toilet paper. So in case we ever go crazy again, maybe you should put some mullen in your yard. This is just a hot pink uh, a volcano with a, a native bee just resting in there. If any of you have um, any of the Apuntias, the, the uh, nice pad forming cactus, one of the things that these things have evolved to do, I would encourage you when your cactus flower, watch the bees in there. They're like they're drunk, but take your finger and run it around that pollen and all of those little uh, pollen sacs just close in around your finger. They actually move to deposit pollen on the bees and you can make the plant. It's almost like a Venus flytrap or something. It's just amazing. Um, gardens are great to play in. Um, you know, the, the prickly poppy is just like this um, sunny side up egg that the bees just go gaga for. Plus, um, it's a long lived poppy. It blooms throughout the heat when other poppies are cool season. This poppy will find its way to the hottest, driest, most inhospitable place in your yard. Super pollinator plant. Um, I was inspired by uh, a, a well-known uh, landscape uh, uh, and national park photographer that I met. I did a, a project uh, at his house many years ago, and he had stones between his flagstones. And I asked him where he got those, where he got the idea. And he said, well, every national park that I photograph, I shouldn't do it, but I pick up some stones, stick them in my pocket, and I bring them home. I put them between my flagstone. I thought, guy. I have stones I collected in the Pacific Northwest when I was, you know, seven years old in the 60s. And I took them out. I put them, I leave about a two inch gap between stepping stones. This is cut concrete. These stones had these holes in them. And one day I was out there with my coffee and I saw holes formed in the soil uh, next to the stones. So every day I would go out with my camera and just stand there hoping for the best. 
And one day I got it, a ground dwelling bee popped up out of there. So I learned that, and I saw this happening in other areas in my yard where I have flagstone pathways. I don't put crusher pine, I don't put mulch. I just leave the native soil. I leave about a two to three inch gap in between the stones and maybe half inch to three quarter inch um, below the top of the stone to the ground and native ground dwelling bees of all sorts just totally populate these areas. When we tore out our swimming pool, it was this big pit of dirt. And within three weeks, I think uh, four to five kinds of native bees and at least two to three kinds of ground dwelling wasps moved in. So as I landscaped the pit, I left all those open areas uh, where the native pollinators lived, hoping to encourage them. This is a slide of the dragonfly that was chasing that uh, hummingbird earlier. Uh, they were chasing each other all over the nursery and I couldn't get them in the same shot, but I got them here. Uh, this is a nice example of um, beneficial and predator or maybe, yeah, beneficial and predator. So this is a tomato hornworm that has been parasitized by a wasp. So what the wasp do is lay eggs in the worm and then they, uh, the, they hatch out and make these little cocoons way at the left side of the screen. You can see sort of a hollow green tube where the wasp has um, emerged. So I don't know if this is, I don't think it's a trica gamma wasp, but it's one of the parasitizing wasps that preys on what we think of as detrimental insect, but are great little pollinators. And um, so this is another example of how uh, if you don't smash all the hornworms or toss them to your turtles, um, they might be uh, a, a host for a beneficial. So um, yeah, build it and they will come. You know, you, you never know what you're going to see. And, and if we create environments um, that have all of the elements that uh, I threw out there, um, you're going to be rewarded with, um, yeah, this terrific opportunity. You know, uh, people would ask me, when they'd see an imperfect leaf, what do I need? I need to buy a bottle of something. And even neem oil and safer soap kill the good guys. And I tell people, you know, get a bottle of wine. If you need a bottle of something, get some wine or, or tea and sit out in your backyard and, and see if you can name every shade of green in this picture and look around. And pretty soon you're going to see somebody flying over to a plant and you're going to observe nature in action and you're gonna become more one with your garden and you're gonna chill and you're not gonna waste a bunch of money. You're not gonna toxify the environment and you might learn something. And then you can just um, de-stress from uh, the weight of the world and pandemics and politics and all the stuff that divides us and understand how connected um, we all really are and need to be. Um, the other day, and I don't want to get too morose, but we crossed uh, a few weeks ago 500,000 deaths from the coronavirus. That same night on my news feed, Joni Mitchell performing Woodstock for the first time in 1969 live, uh, where she sings, we were half a million strong, and it's all about peace and love and joy and coming together. And I believed that in 1969, and that's part of what drew me into horticulture. And when I compared the half a million strong for peace and love and the half a million dead from a virus, if more of us uh, try to work with nature, um, maybe we can get back to the garden. So um, yeah, we enjoy the Orioles, the uh, grosbeaks, beaks, the jays, uh, these guys are seasonal. They come down uh, for all the acorns, all the oaks that I have in my yard. Uh, the bush tits, like I say, they're just um, a circus of delight. Uh, doves, I love. They're just so so peaceful, and uh, you know the hummingbirds uh, are just so amazing and delicate and tough as nails. Uh, nut hatches show up, and sorry, some of these are a little out of focus. Some of these birds move fast. Uh, Orioles come to delight. Um, the hawks have learned that I have all these feeders, and they can fly through the neighborhood and maybe catch something directly, or maybe cause a dove to slam into a glass window and circle around and come back and pick it up. But it's all part of the circle of life, and there are kind of plenty of doves out there. Um, this is just shot through my kitchen window. 
Um, I have ladies brunch. The, the three of these turtles are female and they like to come out mid morning and have a little snack, some turtle chow, some fruit, bananas, uh, whatever. That's Mr. T that you see over to the left. He's never interested in brunch. He wants to see what the girls are up to, but he doesn't care for that stuff. He's a meat eater. So he wants me to feed him mealworms and will even stand on his back legs uh, to take a, a mealworm out of my hands. I, I, I only did this once because it seemed like he would do that. And I decided it was maybe torturous, but he was just so eager. And every spring I wait for Mr. T and Big Mama to emerge. I always understand that maybe I've lost them. And when they come back, it's a beautiful thing. And this particular turtle, every autumn before hibernation time, he comes, finds me in, on the patio and sits between my feet for 20 or 30 minutes. And I pet his back and he ambles away and I don't see him until spring. So I'm hoping that uh, in another month or so, my old friends will come back to see me. You know, these lizards, these be beautiful blue tails, parthenogenic female clones, they don't need don't need men to reproduce. These were common when I was a kid, and I'm grateful to have them as insect control in my backyard. Um, the dragonflies are great predators. They eat tons of mosquitoes and even grasshoppers I've seen them eat. Uh, beautiful pest control. Even this uh, fig eater beetle, this is not the one that makes the grub so much that tears up your lawn, but rather lays its eggs in your compost and the larva help to finish off your compost, much like the soldier flies. Uh, plus they're just beautiful and gorgeous and metallic and, and part of the whole scene. Uh, the mouse has his little cave. He learned that under the hollow stump, if he lived down there, uh, the food source was right up on top. Uh, the top floor was the buffet. So uh, for the season or two that I had that seed bowl up on top, the mouse lived uh, underneath and it was uh, quite the nice little thing. Um, the squirrels destroyed my vegetable garden for a season, uh, but seem to have moved on. I don't see them as much anymore. Uh, those guys and the raccoons, it's, it's cool that they're here, but I, I wish they would go somewhere else. Uh, the woodpeckers and the desert willow, I just love. Um, again, the nuthatches, these are just examples. So I think I just want to end by saying, um, Again, like I, I said at the beginning, I, I don't know if I'll ever be wise, if I'll ever be a sage, um, but nature teaches me every single day and um, I couldn't be more, more grateful for um, the opportunity to be a, a student. And thank you guys for asking me to talk about something I care deeply about.